So, okay, it's time for Xtrix <laughs> update. So, for one who ever heard about Xtrix anything, it's just uh, SDR and mini PCI Express from Factor. It's uh, 30 by 50 millimeters, really small board. And we tried uh, to use uh, uh, PCI Express two lanes to get the maximum performance up to 10 gigabit per second row bus speed. We use LMS 7002 RFIC and actually uh, we're using two channels. So we do MIMO here. And uh, as all our SDRs was, we use GPSDO on board. So we started our first Umtrix uh, SDR and it has GPSDO. So we are still using GPSDO on board. So it's our feature. We also try to put uh, clock synchronization and all the stuff like GPO, SIM cards. So and, uh, you can see it's really packed. So there's no more space to add extra features. So what's uh, inside? Uh, so we use Artix, uh, uh, currently 35 uh, FPGA, uh, where we have um, SIM phi, so it's SIM level translation chip. We have a GPS module for GPS dual, but it can also produce uh, URs, uh, GPS data if you need. Actually, uh, since we are using PCI Express device, it has a really low jitter and uh, really low latency. It's uh, really easy to make like uh, network uh, uh, e 1588 clock source for the network because it has a GPS. So, but uh, PCI Express is not mini PCI Express uh, card uh, specification it says it has a PCI Express lane, one lane actually, and the second lane is optional. So we use uh, both lanes, but not most uh, motherboards support this feature. So for that, we develop special adapter. I'll speak later on. And uh, for the motherboards who doesn't have uh, PCI lines routed at all, so we had a USB 2.5 chip. So it's like a last resort. If you don't have a PCI Express, you at least can do something using USB 2.0. Uh, X6 has 20, 12 uh, GPIOs where five of them has uh, different pairs, so it's LVDS. You can do like really high speed data on this uh, GPIOs. Xtrix use a um, very efficient power system, I'll talk about later. And we use uh, all bands available from LMS7 chip. And the main feature was uh, to support the most possible sample rate we can do. So it's above 100. So it's actually a third talk at Osmo Defcom. <laughs> the first talk was uh, actually in 2016. So I'll try to reconstruct uh, chronicle mm. events uh, during our development. Uh, so it's been a long while actually for developing and polishing things. But finally, we are closer uh, to final revision, final production. So as you can see, there was uh, several samples um, and we weren't happy with something. We'll try to improve, improve. And it seems we are like putting a second system effect, like our Xtrix is second system, second SDR. And when you're doing second system, it's always easier to get into endless improvements. So, but what issues we fighting with? So as I said, we try to get as maximum sample rate as possible. So like uh, LMS 7 documentation sales, it's in a, theoretically it can do 160 mega sample. So and we thought that we can do it easily <laughs> in our first revision, turn out that's not really achievable because uh, even a 400 uh, mega sample rate, uh, 
it means that uh, it's 200 megahertz DDR signal on LML on a Lime bus and the uh, Lime interface is CMOS and the CMOS on that speed is really tricky. Typical DDR RAM, DDR2 RAM, for example, use a different uh, file interface for that. But what we managed to do in our board, it's uh, 90 mega samples for MIMO and uh, 120 for CISO. And if you do some black magic, say that word, you can do a significant more. So what is the kind of black magic here? We introduce uh, uh, extra DCDC for manipulating so-called uh, via, via uh, voltage IO interface. We can change it dynamically from one to 3.3 volts. So it's for both uh, doing optimal performance and uh, optimal power usage for your application. So if you're doing like low simple rate, you can reduce voltage and it will give you extra power saving. And uh, when you do need the maximum performance, so you can increase this voltage. But what we noticed uh, in our design, uh, doing more than 90 mega samples in MIMO, it stops working when the temperature arrives. So, and uh, what I achieved uh, Currently, it's 115 mega samples per second in MIMO mode, but it works until 30 degrees of Celsius, so you need to actively cool the whole system to work with. And moreover, you need to do special calibration. So what kind of, of calibration I'm talking about? So it's all about DDR signal. Initially, DDR signal need to know special time to latch the data on the best. So in the it's called like phase delay. Actually, DDR3 RAM, for example, has built-in mechanism in files to actually find the best uh, optimal point for this latch. And DDR4 is a DDR4 RAM is even more complex. They do like channel localization for each bit and find uh, the best like uh, attenuation and other stuff. So we tried to do something similar here. So we wrote uh, a special program is doing LFSR stream over a parallel bus and, and uh, doing different uh, mm -hmm. uh, phase uh, difference, looking at which uh, data lane introduced some error. And based on that, we can find the best optimal phase for the mode. So we can see in this, 140 mega samples size and mode. Uh, only like less two lanes, bit uh, number two and bit number one are more flickery and it reduces more like noise somehow. And uh, these bits are actually limiting for that speed. If you are doing like eight bit, uh, RF signal, you can increase the uh, speed more since uh, the last bit will be uh, like rubbish. But it's not uh, the only issues for high sample rate. And if you can get like 100 uh, plus mega samples per second in hardware, doing it in software is also challenging. For example, typical phosphor implementation on my laptop breaks its 65, it still can display something uh, on more speeds, but it means they, they're constantly uh, drop frames, so you can't see the picture in real time. So there needs to be done more optimization here. Another part, it's really hard, no, not really hard, but it's challenging to get a 12 bit uh, row streaming because 12 bit to 16 bit transformation at that point actually it takes a lot of CPU. So I started uh, to do special SMID instruction, but haven't done yet it. Because doing a really optimal way is just tricky. So we'll release it later. And what we can really achieve from bus performance, 
picture. Actually, x to PCI 2.0 means 10 gigabits per second. It's what actual specification says, but it doesn't mean it's uh, the actual payload you can achieve. Because first uh, it used 4 to 5 bit conversion on the um, L0 layer. So on L1 layer you'll get like 8 gigabit per second. Then on a transaction layer, each transaction is up to 128 bytes maximum. On most systems, some system, some modern Intel system and Xeon system can do with 256 bytes. But actually my laptop on the 128, it gives some restriction and do it control channel and other stuff. It's, that's all limiting up to like 6.8 gigabit. So it's not really like really efficient bus, but it's what you can really get. And uh, our implementation of DMA is really efficient. So what I could achieve at 6.7 gigabit, so it's almost the theoretical limit. USB 3.0, it's always the same picture. It says five gigabit per second, but it's only on net layer. So it does the same four to five bit conversion and you'll get like four gigabit per second. So what we achieved in USB free mode, it's only 3.1, but I'll talk about it later. Another point uh, was power optimization. Mini PCI Express from Fractor strictly declares 2.5 power consumption maximum. So when we did uh, our first revision of boards, we used three DCDC channels and uh, two LDOs, and turned out so it was above three was in most uh, was operational ways. So we found that we used a single LDO that was doing from 3.3 to 1.8 volt for LMS chip and actually it was like almost a watt of heat dissipation. So we completely redesigned the whole power system for robot. Now it's eight DC DC channels, all programmable in software. So it has a high to see you can do any voltage from 1.0 to 3.3, but you need to be very like uh, accurate because uh, applying uh, high voltage to low voltage network, you can just burn the chip. <laughs> so it's, you need to do like special care. That's why it's all hidden from software layer. So if you need to do modification, you need to just dig into like low layer library and try to tweak something. So we separate uh, three, par uh, three, three uh, DC DC lines to especially especially to lime chip. So lime chip use like three uh, power voltages. So we have a special channel for each of them to get the maximum power savings. And actually the result is pretty good. For most cases we are in the spec, but doing something crazy like doing MIMO channels. Um, receiving and transmitting at the same time, doing pre-processing on the line chip and achieving maximum sample rate, unfortunately goes above the spec. But it's uh, already impossible to improve it here. <laughs> so another point what we looked, although PCI Express is really good bus, it's really a robust, uh, low latency, it's really hard to work with because most laptop nowadays does have a mini PC Express from Fractor. And uh, the other point, uh, Thunderbolt 3 is not really widespread yet. So as uh, during previous year Intel announced, so they like remove uh, license fee for cheap manufacturers for Thunderbolt 3 and it'll be more open uh, open specs and so on, but still uh, there's not much Thunderbolt 3 
in the consumer sector right now. So we have to stick for USB free, especially for debugging, uh, for developing and for other convenience. So initially I thought that it was completely impossible to do trans transformation from USB 3 to PCI Express. But luckily we found USB 3480 chips. It was famous in uh, uh, special RNGs for DMA attacks and uh, some security research on PCI bus. So they use it for many un uncommon use cases. So, but we used for exactly what it was developed for. Doing conversion from PCI Express to USB. But since the bus is not mm, transparent, you can't do like uh, DMA to USB free endpoint transformation. You need to write a special layer of software compatibility. So, so we developed a special library. It's already published on our GitHub. So you can use support other, any other PCI Express device that you want to use over USB free. And actually the performance is okay. We were able to get more than 100 meter samples in size mode. So it's really useful. And uh, one more interesting feature, this chip has four GPIOs, so I do, and I think it's be good to do GTAC. So when I do GTAC over these GPIOs, using a simple bing banging using libusb, just to rewrite the full FPGA image, it took me almost 40 minutes. That's not something, <laughs> Uh, it's not really user experience you want. <laughs> After optimization uh, in lib USB, doing multiple transactions, so on, I was able to achieve only 27. So that was not usual anymore. But using uh, 8058 uh, marker control built in into this chip, it was I was able to get initial performance below four minutes and doing assembler optimization of bit banging, I was able to get like a minute, slightly more than a minute. And it's, uh, and the minute is uh, okay. So you can wait a minute to upload the new image. It's not an hour. Another challenge for doing transformation using this chip, it has limited number of endpoints, actually four endpoints, and each endpoint can have four kilobytes before maximum. So in doing like a real massive operation, it might be a problem. And actually it was. When I start, uh, when I wrote initial design using one endpoint, I could achieve on transmission up to 160 megabytes per second and 128 on the receive side. So what I did called uh, interleaf mode, when I send odd packets to zero endpoint and even packets to first endpoint. So it's actually doubled the FIFO size because it's operational kind of uh, doing uh, the same time. And uh, I could achieve more speed. Initially, RIX was more, actually RIX get more gain than 2X. I don't know why. But the, a real disadvantage of it, you need to take care of some like USB timeout event. And when you get USB timeout event on first endpoint and you and you don't get any feedback from zero endpoint, your data can be messed up. So your handling in the scheme is not uh, so easy. Yeah, initially uh, I wanted to add CDC interface for our GPS and SIM card, but uh, actually there is no in more endpoints to do with this. And uh, that's why it's not exported as usual uh, CDC ACM device. And another thing that I noticed that working over lib USB with uh, more than 250 megabytes per second, it's very, you can get the same jitter as in PCI Express mode. So even doing real-time kernel, real-time option for stock kernel, 
doesn't uh, help much. So it definitely helps, but uh, it's not like a complete remedy for this. So probably kernel driver will help, but right now we don't want to do it, at least right now. But for other speeds that's USB free is great. So what's look like in FPGA? Oh, we try to do an our FPGA design as simple as possible to use like the least dependency uh, possible. Oh, and uh, it's like two buses. One bus is a 64 bit. 125 megahertz it's like dma bus high freak uh, high speed bus and another is xca xca's bus for peripherals so we have simple ur simple a2c and we have a special course like uspi course for doing a firmware update and to store some extra data for example some calibration data and other things and we have a USB 2 core for things for the reason where PC Express doesn't work. And also we introduced uh, Risk Five a soft core. Initially, it's using only for USB 2 enumeration, so USB 2 enumeration is done in soft core, but it's very useful for other any <coughs> applications we can do like tuning from soft core and doing some commands, uh, some calibration, some like any other scheme. So what's uh, current utilization? So we are using 35 Artex now. Actually, we occupy 100% of, of VRAM. It's mostly uh, to do RX P4 and uh, TX P4, but it can be reduced. It's like overkill to work well with uh, any system. For example, if I use Atom motherboard or Xeon motherboard, I can like use one quarter of this before it uh, will work without any underruns or overruns. But using on my laptop, this has this um, fancy 4K screen and you, when you do switching between windows, it can easily get a bus stop for some time and without proper buffering you can get the same level of performance so for some system it's a must so we don't do D any dsp here so it's completely free and we want to use it uh, as an, an uh, extra accelerator here we are thinking of doing some acceleration for 4g for lte and other networks but right now there's no no released yet and uh, yeah you can actually almost one quarter of lut so you can add any other you want so as mentioned we had usb2 support mostly uh, not as i mentioned not mini all mini pc express from factor actually have pc express lanes and not all users actually need the uh, 100 plus megasamples per second. But using it for like Raspberry Pis and the other stuff should be really useful for. Currently, I have an implementation of ULPI interface to endpoints. So enumeration is already done. So, but uh, no host libraries is provided yet. So I can start developing for this, but hope to finish this work right after we ship the board. So what's current status of software? Actually, all our host libraries and kernel driver for PC Express is already on GitHub, so you're welcome to use it for x or any other projects. And we provide some uh, software for third parties. And definitely we provide Sophie ZR plugin. Actually, it's not all feature implemented yet, but we are working with them. So if you have some application in mind, so let us know. We'll test whether this feature works fine. Definitely GROS SDR works. 
fine. Then the, we started it time with tech support. We will discuss yesterday. Osmer Cherry XL there. Use our native interface. It uh, was really interesting because in our uh, stack only Osmo Turex uh, that was dependent on UHD, like took really uh, lib boost and tons of other develop dependencies. And when we switch to using the six tricks, we can get rid of like tons of our needed dependency. The FPJ code is not published yet, so it's we will be published as we ship the board. And we are working on multi extract synchronization right now. And definitely we want to get the more user experience, more like better user experience. So if you know what to test, so tell us, we'll definitely test this. So when we get everything all working, so we think how to what to do next. So and uh, initially, you know, we uh, think this crowd support was a great idea to push X tricks. So uh, and one thing was uh, what to <coughs> actually put on crowd supply because we had so many ideas of X tricks that can be combined with different FPGA options with different temperature. It can be industrial or commercial. It can has a GPS or can be without GPS. So initially we want to put uh, many options, but it is a really bad idea for crowd source. It's more likely you'll get like few pieces of that, few pieces of that, few pieces of that, and still run out in the higher cost. And you had just to increase price for the most option. So that's why on crowd supply we just uh, make one things for each option. So it was one X tricks, one adapter for USB free, one PC Express to mini PC Express adapter, and one massive MIMO package. So since it's uh, just one USB free adapter, I think it's a good idea to put everything we can do, everything we can imagine into the single adapter. So it was it's what looks like our first design and center if it's not clear it's uh, OLED display that can actually display not just text that can display graphics it can draw like uh, initially was I did put uh, some spectrum here and other fancy stuff but we were afraid of doing another year of development on this <laughs> so <laughs> we get rid of this Yeah, you, you can connect the display uh, driver uh, data. So it's a brief history of our USB adapter history. So this picture of our first revision, actually a pre-revision uh, already. And the last revision used six layer boards just to get rid of emissions on uh, USB free lanes and PC Express lanes because current design has a high speed length on top layer and uh, you actually can see it in spectrum so actually what our final design looks like it's since in model almost the same but without display yeah it's here actually i can pass around if somebody has seen it <laughs> So what's interesting in our design? So as I said, uh, we are fighting with power consumption and uh, we want to have uh, this SDR to be basically cooled. So that's why we introduced a special thermal optimization. So our case actually is a heat sink to the board. So this uh, aluminum brick and center is actually right uh, below the LMS7 chip. So when you screw the board, it will attach to that heat stick. And all the excessive heat will be dissipated onto the case. So it's what's inside. 
to this brick and it what will look like when we get this final borsal. Actually our boards are being manufactured right now. We'll get uh, uh, during the next week and we will can test everything is USB free. But uh, yeah, another reason uh, for that fancy boards, uh, you can actually remove the PCB from the case and work on table without case or you can install it in the case, so it's up to you. Another product uh, we put on Cloud Supply it was our PC Express to Mini PC Express adapter. The main reason for that was since our X64 utilized two PC Express lanes, and there like no adapter on the market that actually used two PC Express lanes. So our adapter used standard PCI Express X4 to our mini PC Express <coughs> a socket. So it actually used two lanes and actually it has a preamps, uh, LNAs, uh, GTEC and other stuff. That said, I, sh I should uh, want to add that if you don't need uh, all this fancy stuff, uh, like no LNAs, no amps, uh, no X2 PCI Express, you can buy uh, a very simple uh, mini PCI Express to uh, typical PCI Express on Alibaba for like, you know, five dollars or something yeah. like this. Yeah, the only limitation it will be just one lane. So it's like performance for our board. So it has pre-driver, it's almost 20 dB the whole band. Actually, it has a small gain on uh, low frequency, but we'll optimize it actually due to low capacitors. And LNA gain is not so linear, but it's probably LNA almost works here. So what's overall status of our Carol Supply campaign? So there is good, good news and bad news. Good news, so we have all our hardware design finished and file prototypes, either we get them or we've been manufactured and we get them soon. So no more optimizations are planned, just like we need to, to manufacture it. The bad thing, actually we can't deliver initial date because one of components is only will be in July, it's actually our crystals and we can't just uh, use another crystal because there's no options for the price performance. So what will be in the future? So since, since Crowd Supply version has one XPX, we are thinking to do two options like pro options, mostly used for industrial embedded application and light options that use small HPG and for commercial usage. And uh, X6, it's not just a board, it's almost a framework we'll be using to build more products. And currently there are two things we're thinking about. It's M2 version, but uh, for M2 it's always complicated which form factor in which key to utilize. So you have a good idea, so <laughs> Please give us feedback because for us it's really hard to guess. And another thing we are thinking about to do is X-Trix with power amplifier built in. They may be during this year or may well not. So we'll see. So thank you. As, uh, as far as I understood you, you are not doing sig digital signal processing on uh, FPGA at the moment? or Yeah, because everything is done on the uh, LIMES chip. Ah, uh, yeah, uh, but so you are streaming for base digital baseband, yeah, yeah. Through, through it, okay. Well, I mean, there is a down sampler uh, built into the LMS7 chip, so we can sample okay. at a higher frequency than the what we are streaming.
Yeah, I just wanted to comment. So you said you have a native backend for Smoothie RX uh, or something like that? Uh. Native what? Yeah, native software for Smoothie RX, yeah. It's yeah, um, but uh, so we are not talking about the UHD one then? Yeah. Okay, and uh, wha wha where's that? Like it's on our GitHub. In your GitHub? Yeah. Okay, not in the Osmocom one, right? Not the Osmocom one. Okay, uh, are there plans to... Yeah, there is a plan. Uh, put them together or? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because it's need to do uh, like more refactoring. Because what I did, I remove all UHD stuff and put my stuff. So it can't be used with UHD. So we need to decide how to do better merge of this. Because there's no like abstraction in, a, in the Osmo Trix to use one or other mold. So I had to replace some holes okay. to be it more like compatible with X6. <coughs> the cheap approach is what we do in Osmo BTS, uh, which would basically be to simply um, link. So when you build Osmo TRX, you link one executable that talks to UHD, you link another executable that yeah. talks to X3X, and you link another one that talks yeah. to LibUSRP. And I think it's fine. I mean, in the end, we're not talking about a 200 megabyte large executable, but a very small binary. So I think it's okay. Then this way we don't need to introduce uh, now big uh, yeah. infrastructural changes. So we just it's just linking different uh, object files, and we create uh, one binary for each target. I think that's perfectly yeah, fine. Yeah, that can work. 